<clears throat> before we get into the passage for the night, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing hymns, I'm sorry, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Teaching and admonishing. Admonish one another. You just did that. <clears throat> Have you ever done that since you've been up here? Do you guys even know that's what you thought about each other? And then can I encourage you and I'm not going to say invite him. I leave on Thursday. I'm going to invite you to. I encourage you not to wait for something like this. It should happen. Uh, those of you who are words of affirmation people, who are you? Like words of affirmation mean the world, right? I'm that person. My wife knows it. Usually she slips a, a note in my bag when I leave. She slips it. She says, one time she tried to sneak it, but I caught her. And she's like, why'd you come out? <laughs> I'm sorry. But yeah, what if you did this on a regular basis? Like, what if you asked the Lord, is there something I'm supposed to say? Who's the one today you want me to encourage? Who, who am I supposed to confront lovingly? But we need to encourage one another, friends. We hear discouraging. You ever notice you're the, you are your worst critic? You ever notice the thoughts that come into your mind, whether it's you, your flesh, or it's the enemy? But it's, it's rarely how how wonderful you feel. It's usually, I, I just messed up on that, I messed up on that, I'm not measuring up with that. Friends, we're supposed to encourage each other because we hear the other, the other garbage all the time. Thank you for letting me be part of this. Man, I, I was expecting just a few. And y'all just started going popcorn style, just boom, kept going. <clears throat> I don't know your name. What's your name? Are you Katie? Haley. You're Haley, okay. I'm not going to make you do anything. But I wonder if the passage we've been looking at is the invitation that you need to be reminded of. And I don't know if not. I have no clue what's going on. But if Jesus is saying, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Maybe that's the, maybe that's the word for you, okay? Can I pray for us as we jump in? <clears throat> Spirit of God, we thank you for the ministry that you do in us and among us, and I pray that you would help us to be attentive to you throughout the day, not just waiting for speaking times or chapel times or some spiritual moment, but all day, every day, living in awareness of your presence, wanting to be used by you, wanting to speak your words into people's lives, even if it's the words that we have to confront, that we would do it lovingly and graciously because we actually believe we're all in this together, moving forward as a community, and as, and as the family of God, wanting to see each other succeed. Jesus, I thank you for that invitation. What a beautiful invitation from the creator of the universe. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am humble and gentle in heart, and you will find rest. You will find rest for your souls. I pray for rest. Rest for the souls who are in this room, God. As we, as we accept your invitation. And now, Spirit of God, I pray that you would speak, convict us, and encourage us, whatever is necessary to make us look more and more like Jesus. And we commit this time to you. We come under and submit ourselves to your scriptures because it's true. God, we love you. We thank you that you love us like you do. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone who agrees says, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> thank you all. Uh, Mark 14, starting in verse 3. And while he, that's speaking of Jesus, while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard. It's a pretty name, isn't it? Isn't it the Christmas gift you want to get? I got you nard. I mean, it just sounds awful. Very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. So what's the context of this? So you can keep your finger there and go over to John chapter 12. 
in John chapter 12, you see, the, you see from two different perspectives, two different apostles, or no, well, two different disciples that are writing about this. Most people think that Mark, um, Mark was written, well, of course, by Mark, but he's listening to Peter preach and tell stories, and so Mark is writing it down. Uh, so two apostles' perspectives. So here in John chapter 12, starting in verse 1, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. That should be underlined in your Bible. It's not just a narrative. It's not just saying, hey, this is some cool thing that happened. The dude was dead, like gone. And Jesus did what? Well, t- turn back a page. We'll go through it a little bit. Um, John chapter 11, starting verse, verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. And when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is. The illness is for the glory of God, so that the Son of of God may be glorified through it, through his illness. Because that really goes against the idea that so many name it and claim it preachers say. If you have enough faith, then you'll never be sick and you'll always be wealthy. The problem with that is the Bible. Jesus, and then watch this, verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so because he heard that he was sick and because he loved them, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. That makes no sense. Guys, why do you think, you bring it back, why do you think that Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus about Lazarus? What are some, what are some ideas? Why do you think? Say again? Heard of, heard of his healings or actually watched them. I imagine that they would have watched them and they were pretty tight. What else? Yep. He loved them. And the, and the family knew it. I mean, Jesus had spent time with them. And so it's like, get word to Jesus. I mean, we've seen him heal everybody else and so he can come through and he can heal him. There's this belief that he can do it. But he waits. And then after he said this, um, to the disciples, let us, go to Ju- let us go to Judea again, verse 8. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to him, our friend, isn't that beautiful? Our friend, this is the creator of the universe, our friend Lazarus, has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. And Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. I'm glad that I wasn't there and that he died so that you could believe. Friends, when we go through the difficult times, we go through the situations that don't make sense to us, we need to pull back and remember that God is sovereign, that God knows what he's doing, and there's a greater purpose behind what he's planning to do. Guys, I learn most through the times of discomfort, through the times of trial. I learn more through those times than through the times of comfort. And yet, think of our lives. How much of our lives are spent trying to be as comfortable as possible? It's almost like this. Has anyone ever heard the statement I was talking? I don't remember who I was talking about it with. Uh, you heard the statement, God will never give you more than you can handle. I gotta tell you guys, that is a lie. That's a lie. Think about it. why would God never give you more than you can handle so we can become self-reliant and not talk, not talk to it at all, not rely upon him? Guys, do you realize in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul himself says, I was so depressed to the point that I wanted to die. Like I couldn't handle this. But this was so that I would not learn to rely upon myself, but on God who raises the dead. So when you hear someone say, God, I'll never give you more than you can handle. You say, yes, he will. And, at some, and someday in this walk with Jesus, we will thank him for it. Because it's in those times when we rely upon him for everything, when we need him, that he comes through. And you say, well, Brian, I'm in this season. It just seems like he went silent. Okay, well, let's take that for just a second. In Mark, the end of Mark chapter 4, remember that's the passage where Jesus gets in a boat with his disciples and says, let's go to the other side. Remember that part? And do you remember, who, does anybody remember what happened to Jesus while they're going to cross? He's in the boat with them on this one. He falls asleep, right? He just conks out. And then what happens? The storm hits. Do you think Jesus knew the storm was coming? 
I do. I think he knew. Guys, let's get in the boat. And he conks out. Guys, these aren't like massive fishing boats. They're not huge cruise liners. Just picture tiny little fishing boats. And Jesus is conked out on a cushion. And water's coming in the boat. I mean, they're terrified. you got fishermen who are used to the Sea of Galilee, and they're terrified. This is bad. And yet Jesus never woke up. Guys, has anyone ever heard, had somebody wake you up by just pouring water on you? Isn't that just joyful? Doesn't it just make you say some sweet words in your mind? Oh my gosh, that just drives me crazy. I hate it. I'm, okay, quick story. I remember when I was a youth pastor and we did it. I asked the students, hey, what, what is something you like to do you might bring your friends to that they might like to be part of? And the student leader said, hey, could we do an all-nighter? And I went, son of a gun. I hate those things. I hate them. Like, all oh, the students love them. And they only love them until like 3.30 in the morning. And then they get all cranky. But we all have to stay up. And so I said, oh, I'm just suffering for it. This is me picking up my cross. I said, okay, but here's the deal. You got to stay up all night. Absolutely. And they're always, we'll do it. We'll do it. They're all like Peter. Yeah, we'll do it. Totally. We'll do it. The night that, I mean, there's a ton of kids that came to this thing. And the night I'm seeing kids walking in with sleeping bags and pillows. I'm like, this isn't a sleepover. I'd rather be at home in bed with my wife than all y'all. But this is, this is what we're doing. We're, so I said, what's the sleeping bag for? When we get tired, but we're not going to go to sleep. And then why bring it, you liar? And so I remember there's this young lady who'd never been to our church community before. Um, I don't remember. I didn't remember, remember her name after she told me. And so she's in there. She's having fun. And I'm telling you, about 3.30, people are like, yeah. <sighs> like the sugar kicks in, and they're like sugar, like it all left their body. And all they've had is pizza and sugar, and that's it. And they're just cranky. So I, I sent the guys upstairs in the church building. And we have a tiny little building. It wasn't big. I said, guys, you're going to sleep upstairs. Ladies, we had a house across the alley. I was like, ladies, that's where you're going to be in the living room. Just sleep there. Um, and I'm going to just be right in the middle. And if, ever, if either one of you leave that place, I will destroy you. I am not in the mood for this. And you're like, why'd you stay up? Obvious reasons, my friends. And so they stayed apart. 7 a.m., time to wake them up. Oh, I love that part. So I grabbed a guitar. I didn't, even, I didn't even look for a chord. I just went up to the guy's room. I just started strumming. I turned the lights on. Bang, 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 bang. And they're not moving. So I took it off. At the time, I was about 280 pounds. And so I laid on the floor and I just steamrolled all of them. I'm like, nah, nah. when you get to the little guys and the, <laughs> you hear this, oh, oh, oh. when it was the little guys, I was just like, <laughs> just trying to just flatten them in the carpet. And I just kept going, guys, get up. I'm not going to clean up this junk by myself. Get up. And they all start getting up. So now it's time to go wake up the ladies. I did not do the steamroll because I wanted to keep my job. So <laughs> I knock on the door. I knock on the door. This young lady comes running up. She opens the door, but she's pretending like she wasn't sleeping. Why are we so embarrassed by if someone knows we were sleeping? You ever notice that? You get a phone call late at night. You're out. You're like, <gasps> hello. I mean, like, <laughs> you like clear your throat. You would normally sound like, hello, but it's like, hello. So she opens the door. Hey, Brian. I'm like, you're a liar. You were sleeping. You got crap in your eyes. And so she goes back. I said, everybody up? Oh, but almost everyone's up except that new girl. And so I walked over and I just gently touched her on the shoulder. And I said, hey, and I can't remember her name. Hey, you, buckaroo, like, <laughs> time to get up. And no joke, this and she was this, I mean, she was tiny. She's like up to my belly button. And she goes, no. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, Minga has possessed your body. I said, I, uh, I don't think you heard me correctly. I said, it's time to get up. No. And then she went further into her sleeping bag. She's like, no. <laughs> and so I just started to peel it back a little bit. She's like, <laughs> she's making noises. And I'm thinking in my head, like, where do you think you're going to go? There's a zipper at the bottom. Unless, the, unless that's the sleeping bag that leads to Narnia. You're screwed. And so I finally said, you know what? you got to get up. you got to help me. No. I said, I know I've heard that before. So if you don't get up, I'm just going to pour water in your head. I gave her a warning. I gave her a warning, strong warning. I was like, come on, get up. No, she man, this is rebellion now. And here's the thing. I learned in parenting, if you make a threat, you got to follow through. And I was so excited. <laughs> and so I, I went to the kitchen, which was just right around, right around the corner. I found the biggest thing I could find, hoping that if she heard it filling up, she would get up. 
So it's a picture about that big. And I just kept it going. And I walk in, and there she's... <laughs> the sleeping bag's like seething. <laughs> and so I said, okay, this is your last chance. Would you please... I even begged, would you please get up? <laughs> Pulled that thing back, and wham! I drenched her and her sleeping bag. Man, she got up quick. She likes to look me straight in the belly button and she's like, mm. I said, well, good morning. Yeah, she never came back, but it was <laughs> victory. <laughs> I always use that story because think about Jesus. Water's hitting him, but he's not waking up. How, how exhausted do you have to be? And when the storm hit, guys, for those of you that are going through it, they ask the question, the same question that we ask when we go through the storm. They said this to Jesus. They woke him up and they said, don't you care? Isn't that what we think? Don't you care if we drown? And then Jesus got up and he talked to wind and waves and it obeyed. Guys, you realize the only thing in creation that has a hard time obeying God is human humanity. Everything else in creation obeys first time, except for people. And he looks at it and says, why, what happened? Why, why, why couldn't you believe it? And then they didn't know who he was. Like, who is this guy that he commands wind and waves and they obey? Friends, for those who are going through the storm, is it possible that God is trying to give you an understanding of who he really is, a new perspective of his holiness or his power that would not come had you not had to go through the storm? Is it possible that he's doing a greater work than you can ever imagine? And so he gets word that Lazarus is sick and he waits and Lazarus dies. And you get to verse 17, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in a tomb four days. Bethany was near, was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. And so when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. One goes, one stays back. There's nothing in the passage that says that I have my own guess as to why I think Mary stayed back. Why do you think Mary stayed back? Wait, anybody guess? Yeah. Well, Mary's by herself. Martha goes to meet him. Mary stays back and did not meet him. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, she was I think so. I think she's ticked. You been mad at Jesus ever? Like, I don't want to talk about that. I think that's why. Why else wouldn't she go? I don't get it. So Martha goes, and, she has, and she, this is the first thing that she says to Jesus, verse 21. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So don't we say the same kind of thing? God, if you'd been here, this wouldn't have happened. God, if you were in control, this wouldn't have happened. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, I know that he'll rise again. And Jesus said to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? If Jesus walked in the room, I guarantee you this, I would not keep preaching. I wouldn't say, hey, I know you're in your glory. Hold on just a second. I'm not done reading your word. If he walked in and said this, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Guys, do you realize the enemy's tactic is this, is to get you to question this? It happened in Genesis 3. Genesis 3, he looks at Adam and Eve and says, well, looks at Eve first and says, did God really say? Did God really say? And I don't think it was like on day three. It doesn't say how long. I don't say how many years. It doesn't say if it was years or days, decades. Have no clue. But Satan knew. He knew how to get him. Did God really say, and isn't that what happens today? You really believe this book? This doesn't fit with the culture. Do you realize how wacky our culture is now? And yet we can't, we can't, we can't make them the target of our wrath. Friends, they're supposed to be the target of God. They're, they're, well, we are by nature, according to Scripture, targets of God's wrath, but the cross is a declaration that God's grace is targeted toward them. 
Remember Jesus, as he's being crucified, as he's being attached to the cross, what does he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Followers of Jesus, shouldn't we be saying the same thing for people that don't know Jesus, if that's how Jesus prayed? Father, they don't know what they're doing. Please forgive them. Stand in the gap. Stand in the gap and see that people would come to Christ. What would you say if Jesus says, do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ. Let's go down to verse 28. And when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Uh Uh-oh. Anybody have a go walk when you're ticked? You know your go walk? Like if there's people in the way, they just kind of get out of the way. And if they don't, you just mull them over. I think that's what this is. Verse 30. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, notice what she first does. She fell at his feet. She fell at his feet. Saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Notice they both said the exact same thing. I wonder if they had actually said that to each other. If Jesus was here, this wouldn't happen. And now they have him in front of him. Lord, if you'd been here, this wouldn't have happened. Bless you. Guys, you know where else? Here we go, Keith. And, uh, someone turn to Luke 10 for me, please. And you're going to have to read it. Out loud. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 38. I'm just going to have you read... Uh, 38 and 39. Perfect. Stop right there for a second. Here in chapter 10, Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet. Lazarus is fine. Martha's serving. Anybody more like Martha than Mary? Busy, 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 busy. Serve, serve, earnest. I just kept hearing that was over and over. People were just talking about your servant's heart. That's beautiful, right? But Martha was different because all of a sudden, verse 40, but Martha was distracted with my servant and she went up to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. Isn't it beautiful that sisters didn't get along then either? Completely different. Martha's servant, Mary's just sitting at Jesus' feet, just listening, going, I love what he's saying. I'm adoring him. Guys, I think that's, what, I think that's why she's at his feet in this verse. In chapter 11 of John, why do you think she's at Jesus' feet there? Is it adoration? Why do you think? Or do you think she's broken? I think she's broken. But she, he, she knows to go to the feet of Jesus. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Guys, that's my favorite memory verse all growing up through Christian school. John 11, 35, I nailed that sucker every time. A plus. I didn't even need to study. Nailed it. First time. Jesus wept. Guys, you know why I love that verse now? Not just because I could pass it in elementary school. If Jesus knew what he was going to do and raise Lazarus from the dead, why would he cry? Who cries at movies? Who here cries at movies? It's okay. Be proud. You've got emotions going. All right. How many of you, how many of you that cry at movies do you cry the second time? You still cry? <laughs> Are you just hoping like, I just know it's going to be different this time. <laughs> Come on, Lord. And then they die again. You're like, dang it. <laughs> One more time. The third time's the charm. That's when they'll make it. So why would he cry if he already knew what he's going to do? Because everyone else was. Death sucks, guys. You ever been to a funeral and thought, it's not supposed to be like this. It doesn't feel right. Because it's not supposed to be like that. We brought death. Like we broke everything. Jesus wept. I love when you get down to verse 39. They get to the tomb. Jesus says, take away the stone. Good old Martha. (laughs) She's so awesome. The sister of the dead man said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus, we shouldn't move it because there's, he's got some stank. 
We shouldn't, we shouldn't move it. As if Jesus is going to go, I didn't even think of that. I was going to bring him back from the dead, but not if he's got body odor. Like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Remember, Jesus prays out loud for the benefit of everyone who's there, and then all of a sudden he screams out, Lazarus, come out. You wonder if some of the Jewish religious leaders that are sitting there going, what kind of guy is this? What a jerk. Like you're actually gonna, you're actually gonna speak to a dead person and expect that he comes, and then all of a sudden here comes Lazarus. <laughs> He's been wrapped for burial. And at the end it says, unbind him and let him go. Friends, that's the context so far of John chapter 12 and Mark chapter 14. That's what happened. Mary didn't go out to greet him goes to his feet just like she did when she adored him. She went to his feet when she's broken. Now she's here in chapter 12, verse 3. Therefore, Mary took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. Isn't she at his feet once again? First time, in my opinion, to adore him. The second time because she's so broken before him. And the third time is to worship him. And she wasted a whole lot of stuff because she loved him. And look at the response of some people. Uh, the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Verse 4, but Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, he was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Guys, let's go back over to Mark and listen to what he actually really said. Not just that. Listen to these words from Judas. <clears throat> Verse 4, there were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? Friends, Jesus is about ready to go take a cross and therefore the wrath of God for the sin of humanity. And Judas has the nerve to vocalize to people around him because jealousy or envy, envy or his, uh, his desire for more, his greed has now overwhelmed him that he would actually voice to other people, why would we waste this on him? Wow. Do you think that stung? Knowing what he's about to do? Do you think that Jesus just like, oh, wow, that one hurt. Why was it wasted Really? Guys, sometimes you just got to show Jesus how much you love him, even if you have to quote-unquote waste stuff on him. And look at his response, guys. This freed me in ministry. This is not me prepping for this, this week. This is quiet time years ago that God freed me from a whole lot of stuff. Verse 6, and Jesus said, leave her alone. And I don't think he's like, leave her alone. Come on. Come on. Guys, I think he got loud. I think he screamed, leave her alone! Boom! <gasps> we just ticked off the dude that brought someone back from the dead. I bet he could kill us with a word too. Leave her alone. Now watch what he says next. Why do you trouble her? Watch. She has done a beautiful thing to me. Guys, do you ever think, you ever wonder, you ever wonder what Jesus thinks about you when you do the things that you do for him? Because if all that you ever hear is this, that's it, that's it, I died for you. That's all you got? Guys, is it really that impressive for, to walk in with a little bottle of perfume and to pour it on some dude's head and then to wipe it up with your hair? It's like, is it, is it that difficult? No. But to Jesus, what is it? Beautiful. Every single little thing that you do as worship unto Jesus, he sees as beautiful. And you'll see how much he appreciates it. Watch. He says, For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But she will not always have me. Now, if you have a paper Bible, underline this if you want to. And you say, oh, I can't underline in the Bible. It's his word, not his face. You'll be okay. Verse 8, watch. She has done what she could. <sighs> Freedom. No more comparison, friends. No more. No more comparison. Don't sit there and go, But I can't do that. Guys, I cannot tell you how often people, it's like, 
It's kind of like you elevate the pastors, especially the ones who can communicate. It's like, oh, I could never do that. Praise the Lord. Because that is such a small minority of the ministry that happens throughout the week. Because I look at Mark back in our home church, or the church that I get to lead. That boy sets up chairs and loves it. I don't get it. I think I told you about him last night, right? He loves it. Drives me up the wall because I feel horribly convicted. He is doing just as much work for the kingdom as I'm doing. Guys, don't compare. Comparison. Guys, don't you think we have a culture of comparison that's constant and it's plaguing us? You know how I know that it's true? Because how often are you scrolling through Instagram and you're looking at everyone's lives or the best picture they could come up with for that thing that they did? And you go, but I'm not doing that, or my life doesn't look like that, or I'm not going there on vacation, my, I'm not doing as much as they are, and it's just this comparison. And the whole while you hear this just plaguing your mind, and, if, and it's as if Jesus is sitting there going, could you do me a favor, could you stop listening to that and hear me say, what you've done for me is beautiful, because you did what you could. Oh, it's freeing. Because now you're not trying to impress them. You're just trying to love them. You're just trying to worship them. You want to be with them. And to hear those kind of words come from him. And if no one ever sees it, friends, it doesn't matter. That's why I'm always challenging our people back home. I'm trying to remind myself. I struggle with insecurity just like everybody else. I struggle with comparison. But guys, I used to have all that social media stuff. And man, I just had a bunch of followers. And I'm following tons of people. And then I'm, I'm posting pictures <laughs> of where I'm preaching. But I do it from the like, way in the back so no one can see me, and then I do it at an angle. It looks like there's 75,000 people, and there's like 16, but it's like, look at, look at what I'm doing, and I'll, and I'll post, and like, humbled to be here, and then people start double tapping, and I'm like, 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 oh, God's using you, God's using you, God's using you. It's like, isn't that encouragement? No, because all of a sudden, the verse came to my mind years later when Jesus says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing, and yet I'm letting everyone know what I'm doing. Had nothing to do with Jesus, had everything to do with me. And I remember sitting in a quiet time by myself in my office, and there's some, it was, it was toward, the Roman, toward the end of Romans chapter 2, and it, I'm paraphrasing, but it says something like, and God will give you his praises. And you're like, what the? And the thought came to my mind. I'm going to be straight up honest. This is exactly what I thought, and I, I believe it was the Lord. Stop prostituting my people for your quick fix of pleasure. Dang! No joke, I ran from my office, opened the door, ran to where my wife, she's in the bathroom getting ready, I said, God just called me a pimp, and then I ran back. That's all that I said. I ran back into my office, and I shut the door. I said, okay, what am I supposed to do? And in that moment, I got rid of it all. Because I knew I was trying to compete with God, but I was also comparing myself with other people. <clears throat> and I could not hear Jesus say, well done, great, beautiful. Guys, if even all that I'm doing compared to what God is accomplishing is grabbing a blade of grass and dipping it in a soap bucket and painting a car, calling it washing it, or I'm watering the street, if that's it, if that's what it feels like, but to God it's beautiful, that story of my boys washing the car, they did nothing in reality to help me one, one bit but I didn't care. Why? I just love the fact that they wanted to be with me. But you can't picture God like that, can you? Can you picture it? He's like, I don't need your help. I don't even need your advice. I just love you being with me. And we get to do this together. Here's an example. Why do you pray if God already knows what you're going to say? He already knows the outcome. He knows what he's going to do. Why pray? That's not rhetorical. I'm going to wait. Why do we pray? God knows. God's got a plan. He already knows what you're going to say before you say it. Think before you think it. Why pray then? Yeah. Okay. So maybe we can see him answer. Yep. What else? Okay, so he, deserves, he deserves respect and therefore speak to him. Okay, I get that. We'll go ahead and then we'll go here. 
He likes talking with us. What is that? Yeah. Guys, you know, I feel like what's pushed a lot, the glory of God, it is, it's huge. Glory, the holiness, the majesty of God. And the beauty and the simplicity and the, the intimacy of his name, Abba. Abba. You know what it means? Father. No, so much more personal. I've never called my dad father. I've never walked in, Father! May I speak with thee, Father? <laughs> Not once. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he says, Our Abba. It's an Aramaic word. Guys, it's what a one and a half year old calls dad. It's Papa or Dada. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Here's what happens we elevate one at the expense of another. Hallowed be your name, holy, unapproachable. I believe that with all my heart. Or we go the other way, Abba, take advantage of him, tell him what to do. You elevate both and you're approaching God for who he really is. Abba, who is holy. That holy God says, out of anything you could call me, call me Abba. Dang. So why pray? Because he likes to hear from us. Guys, growing up, when my boys were little, Power Rangers. I don't like that show. And so I'd come home and they're like, Dad, do you know what happened on Power Rangers? And I'm like, probably. I'm pretty sure it's the same storyline every time it's on. Of course, I didn't say it. I was like, no, tell me. Oh, Dad, okay, it's crazy. It's crazy. You remember the Power Rangers? I do remember the Power Rangers. Okay, you know them? They're all the different color ones. My favorite's the, the, my favorite's the blue one. And so they start going, and, just, and then they got, and then the, bag, the bad guy, he's doing all this stuff, and then they come, they fight him, and then they almost beat him, and then he gets big, and then he starts to beat them, and then they got big, and boom, and then they win, and then there's really bad acting at the end, and then that's it, and it's over, but they won, Dad, they won. What? And what's my response after that? Tell me again. Guys, not because I didn't hear it. Not because I was even intrigued by it. It's because I loved that my boys wanted to talk to me. Welcome to intimacy with your Abba. He knows what you're going to say before you say it, and he still says, tell me anyway. Isn't that beautiful? Don't miss intimacy and relationship with him. Guys, I believe doctrine is so true and needed and necessary. But doctrine that is void of heart connection with the Father as Father of intimacy and fellowship with God is head knowledge. And God's like, I, need, I want your heart. Isn't it amazing? The greatest commandment. Come on, you Bible scholars. What's the greatest commandment ever? Out of, out of the whole Bible, what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? Out of anything that God could ask us, he's like, just love me with everything you've got. That's what I want. It's like, well, it's got to be more than that. No, because if I love him with everything I have, then I'll do what he says. Isn't that what Jesus says? I know those who love me by those who obey my commandments. He wants our hearts, friends. I think some of you need to hear this. She has done what she could. She has done what she could. He has done what he could. And he's defending her in front of everyone. And what she did was so much deeper than anyone there understood. Look what, he, look what he says. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. Guys, she had no clue this was what was coming. But in God's economy, in God's perspective, it was so much more than just an act of quote-unquote worship. It's preparing his body for burial, which means I'm getting ready to go to the cross, and she's preparing my body for it. Do you know that it is so obvious that Jesus is so proud of her. You know why? Look at the last verse. Somebody read it for me. Verse 9. Somebody read verse 9 for me. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Dang! For 2,000 years, wherever the gospel has been preached, Jesus has continued to brag about Mary. Is that nuts? It's like, dang, did you see that? In the year 1521. Oh my gosh, he's still talking about Mary. I am talking about Mary. 
1748, still talking about Mary. Through the 1980s, as weird as those times were, talking about Mary. Now, today, still talking about Mary. Wherever the gospel is preached, this will be told in memory of her. I love that. He brags about the fact that she could pour some perfume on him. Was it the act or was it the heart? It was the heart of worship. Friends, the first time that she goes to his feet, I'm convinced it's because she adores him. Second, because she's broken. And third, because she worships. And she, quote unquote, wasted it all on him. Guys, this is almost a year's worth of wages that she poured out on him. And then she gets humble and wipes his feet with her hair. And to him, this is a beautiful thing. Leave her alone. She's done what she could. Friends, my prayer is that through this whole experience while you're up here together, you would hear God, that the Holy Spirit would allow you to hear, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, well done. I know that, guys, isn't that, isn't that something that you want to hear one day? We always think it's just when we die, then there's like a conveyor belt. We're all in the conveyor belt. And it's like, well done. <laughs> My neck, seven, eight, well done. <laughs> Thank you. And then we go, because Jesus is going to be busy in heaven. So we get the one time, we just got to let it soak in. Like, he said, did he say it to you? He said it to me. I know. But all this time on earth, we just think that he's just sitting there looking, going, that's it? That's all you got? That's all you got? I think you need to hear this, where he says, leave her alone. Leave them alone. They did what they could. They have done a beautiful thing to me. And just like he's bragged about Mary for the last 2,000 years, I'm convinced that he brags about you. And he will continue to do it until you stand face to face with him. And no one may ever know what it is that you did. And yet Jesus, guys, I'm convinced the applause of heaven is deafening because he's bragging about you. Isn't it beautiful to hear that Jesus say, come here, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Last passage. I don't have to turn there. I'm just going to talk about it. At end of Acts 7, the first martyr, right? Stephen. This guys, it's the only place in Scripture where I see that Jesus is standing at the right hand of the Father. Remember, he's getting stoned to death. And he says, he looks up, he says, I, he, I see heaven open. And I see the Son of Man standing at the, right hand of, at the right, right hand of God. Why do you think he was standing? I mean, rocks are being chucked at Stephen. And he's, he's being killed because, he's, because he loves Jesus. I think Jesus was standing in ovation. Why else stand? Guys, even the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus is now seated like he's the high priest who's now seated. You know why that's such a big deal in the book of Hebrews? Because the priests in the temple never sat down because the work was never done. They always stood up. They were always working. Their whole time in the temple, they never stopped. So Jesus comes as the final sacrifice, as, as well as the only last high priest. And when he cries out, it is finished from the cross, he's saying the work that's necessary in the temple is done. And the writer of Hebrews picks up on that and goes, the Son of God is now seated because the work's finished. But in this moment, he's standing. And I'm convinced he's standing in ovation for Stephen. Because he's like, can you imagine? You're looking at, this is what you see? People are throwing rocks at you to kill you. You're like, I see him. I see him. I see him. And then he starts to sound a lot like Jesus, doesn't he? Isn't it nuts? He starts, he starts begging for the forgiveness of those who are killing him. He even says, and then he says, and I commit my spirit to you. I commit, I commit myself to you. I'm like, I could never be like Stephen. Except maybe that was the Holy Spirit, because it says right before that, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will make you sound like Jesus when it's time. He will, he will help you. Those of you who struggle with asking, asking for help, how do I say this lovingly? Get over it. Get over it, because there's such freedom when you do. 
You ask the Holy Spirit who is almighty God, who has no limits to what it is that he can do, help, he will help. So let me encourage you. Friends, in all that you're doing while you're here, please understand that I believe with all my heart, according to the scriptures, the same way that he would say this about Mary is the same thing he would say about you. You are doing a beautiful thing. You are doing a beautiful thing. When you, when you served at Hume SoCal, uh, the ice rink was put together by you all, wasn't it? Or did you help with that? Yes. yes, you did. And I was there watching a bunch of grown men play pickleball on it. I know, you'd think that, why, why weren't they ice skating? Because well, it's, too, it's too hot. But it's like uh, two nets, five people on each side. It looked like junior hires. It was awesome. And I guarantee when I go up there for winter, because I get to speak there in winter, I'm going to watch a bunch of kids playing a bunch of, a bunch of a broom ball on it, and then we have a blast around it because you were willing to serve the Lord, and Jesus said you did a beautiful thing to me. You set up a camp for a bunch of kids who have no clue who you are, but there's a Jesus who, knew, who, who, knew, who knows and saw all of it. And I'm convinced he still brags about it, just like he did with Mary. Guys, thank you for what you do. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Can I pray for you? Jesus, thank you. Oh, I'm so thankful that you see us the way you do. You're amazing. I pray for, I pray for those who need to hear you say those words, that they have done a beautiful thing to me. I pray that, I pray that Jesus, you would remind them that what they're doing is so far beyond what they thought they were doing, just like with Mary. She thought he was, she was just worshiping you, and you said that she was preparing your body for burial. God, I pray that you would take the work that they've done so far and do greater things that they had never thought imaginable. And may they hear you say, God, may they hear you say, well done. Well done. Every single time they serve you. God, would you take them deeper into intimacy with you? God, we love you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone who agrees says, Amen. Love you all more than you know.